Hi, welcome back to Liquid Lunch. My name is James Toto, and I am filling in for John Tobacco. With us right now, we have David Dodd. He is the GeoVax chairman and CEO, and he is also a vaccine expert. David, welcome to the show. I'm glad to have you on. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, uh, looking at what's going on here with vaccinations, not only here in, in the United States, but across the world, um, are, have there been any reported problems showing with either Pfizer or Moderna's vaccines in the first weeks of administration? Well, the only the only reported concerns are these where you're hearing about the people who have certain like face fillers or taking Botox, et cetera. You're seeing some reactions from there. You're seeing other adverse events begin to arise. And frankly, this is what we're going to learn as it begins to be rolled out. When you put it into 10,000 people, even 20,000 people, you're really not going to learn a lot. We'll start learning between now and June because then we'll see it going into millions of people. And that's when we'll really learn that there may be subgroups or situations that cause certain uh, adverse effects that are more serious than others. But it, it'll be a learning curve because this technology is new. It's never been utilized before. Well, what are some of the, uh, the adverse effects that, that we're seeing right now? Well, most of them have been sort of transient, and so they're not major concerns. They're able to be managed and all, from what I understand and what I've, I've read and been following and all. But for some people, you know, they've caused some complications, and, and we've heard that. But, you know, the, the typical pain and that type of reaction or severe reaction, allergic reaction, is one that you want to be able to handle if, they, if it's with an EpiPen or something such as that. And we've seen some of that happening, and we're trying to identify or at least the the public health sector is trying to identify what subgroups, what cohorts, what is, what are the commonalities of these groups or of these people who have certain side effects, so that we can be prepared, be prepared to handle those. And again, it's going to take it's going to take time for us to really understand that. What are what are some of the side effects that they're showing? Uh, they've been seeing some some allergic reactions, such as you know people might get who are allergic to shellfish. So you need to have the EpiPen administration. Those can be you know, quite severe at times. Other times they can be transient, and and, and that's what they're concerned about. The, the pain, the redness, those are common. Those will go away. Okay. Now this is one of my favorite questions because uh, I find it kind of ironic. Should politicians be taking the vaccine now or wait until? all essential workers have gotten. Yeah, I recently was asked this question and I said in the comment I said, and I, and I do believe this very strong, I think it's despicable that people who are healthy and younger are lining up for their staffs and themselves to take the vaccines when it ought to be administered first to, to frontline workers and to those people in need, mostly the elderly people in nursing homes. Not all elderly need to be lined up first either, but certainly those in nursing homes, those who are at the highest risk groups, those who have certain comorbidities, they should receive it before any of these uh, bureaucrats and politicians or staffs are getting it. And, and I think that is, that is, is really, uh, as I said, despicable. Well, I couldn't agree more. Like I'm, I'm involved here in politics down here in South Jersey, and I'm a you know, 50-year-old male who takes good care of them. You know, I take, try and take good care of myself. And, you know, I eat right, I live right, and, and along those lines. So I don't really need the vaccine first. Who actually, you know, outside of the, the frontline workers, who are the people that, that really need the vaccine first? The ones who need it first are people who are in nursing homes and people who have uh, comorbid conditions. When one looks at the data of fatalities, it's almost, to it's so highly congregated not only in those who are over age of 70, but especially those who have comorbid conditions. So anyone who has any underlying illnesses uh, should be receiving it first. And even if, if they are not 70 or older, but certainly those who are 70 or older in nursing homes have comorbid or comorbid conditions or have weakened immune systems, those should be the ones we need to, to cover at first. And then we ought to take it down to others. But as you point out, and we're both saying it, it is just, it, it is an embarrassment to America to see that politicians are lining up to get it first and allowing their staffs to, because they are not the ones in great need. Right. I, I see that they, you know, they're trying to lead from the front and uh, I don't agree with that. I think that you want to know what, look, if, if you're, and I get the whole lead from, lead from the front mentality, I get it. But at the same time, there are people who are in more need than the politicians are, you know, and, and I couldn't agree with you more that, that it is despicable. Um, so how long will it be until the general public starts seeing the, the, the vaccine come their way? 
And how will they? How will the government determine who's in line first? Well, first of all, it's very complex. But but let me answer the first part, and then I'll, I'll comment on if you'd like about the whole distribution logistics challenges that one is going to be facing, and we'll all be dealing with here. I, I think the ones who should receive it uh, first, and when they're going to receive it, is is the the, the recent uh, statement that it'll be by June, or I'll say by the middle of June. For all Americans who 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 want to take it and accept taking the vaccine, I think that's a reasonable timetable. But I think certain cohort populations, it'll be much sooner, and it should be half that time period if we do it right. The challenge in this is such a complex distribution logistic. It's not just about shipping product to certain points. And we realize how diverse the United States of America is. Some counties are so rural and some are so dense and getting people lined up or getting people scheduled in a very dense environment is one thing. Getting out to people who are in environments that are very sparse and very rural is a much bigger challenge. Plus, we've got products, some of which require extreme frozen state. They're double dose, they're, so they're two doses, and some the product is only good for five days. So you start thinking about all those variables and putting those together. If you whatever you ship, if you ship a lot of product. Uh, that is needs to be in frozen state is only good for five days is double dose to say either every 21 or every 28 days you, you for the two shots and you have too much there it, it's going to be bad so you can't just ship it somewhere else because it's only good for a short period of time so this is an extreme challenge from a logistics and planning standpoint but it, that's where I think if we were to start breaking down and isolating, where are these cohort populations located that are most in need? We know the frontline workers. That ought to be the easy part. The harder part is to understand where are all the people who are comorbid, compromised immune systems, elderly in nursing homes, and make sure that it gets to those people first. Right. They know, like where you're at uh, in South Carolina, it, it's, you know, it's a lot different because you do have a lot of small rural towns. How are we going to be able to get the vaccine to those people who really need it that are some people are shut in, you know, some people are there. They live their lives very privately. And how do we get the vaccine to those people? How do we how do we manage that dissemination? Yeah, the challenge for this type of vaccine where it's by and large, the ones that are out right now, this this first wave of vaccines are, are largely multiple doses. They require either refrigeration or frozen state, some less than others. So you've got these distribution challenges. Now, all of those are, are going to be very difficult and the and probably we're going to have to have people go to places to be able to get vaccinated the next wave of vaccines that are like the the novavax type of, of vaccine uh, the geovax vaccine that we're working on which are all being developed to be ours are being developed to be single dose to have broader immunity to require minimal or no refrigeration those will be much easier to be able to ship to, directly to doctor's office, a physician's medical offices, doctor's offices, and be able to administer on site where people are used to going and getting. But this first generation, or we refer to as the first wave, they are much more complex. Uh, they are quick to get to manufacturing, which is terrific. I mean, just really, that's great that we have it there. But it is much more difficult to actually get it to the patient that's going to be vaccinated, that needs to be vaccinated, and make sure we get them out there in record time. You know, having 100 million doses, if half of them or a third of them or a fifth of them go bad because you can't get them to the right people, doesn't really help you out. You have to produce even more. So that's the challenge that we're dealing with right now. Right now, the you said there's there's going to be there's going to be a single dose vaccination coming down the line. What's the timetable on that? Well, several of us, our, our company is, is one of those, works with different technologies that, that have been validated to be able to deliver vaccines against various infectious diseases in single doses, require minimal, uh, require minimal refrigeration and are durable, meaning you don't have to keep coming back. And, but, but they take longer to get there to be able to manufacture. And they're going to be going into the clinic largely in, in 2021, so they probably won't be available at the earliest until 2022. But with the variation and the evolution we're seeing of this virus, it's, it's by and large becoming to be well-believed and standard belief that, that the coronavirus vaccines are not going to just be for COVID-19. We're going to need them. And they're going to be more like seasonal flu. They're going to have to be modified. So a single vaccine may be what we need today to stop it, but we're going to need more. Okay. Well, it looks as though, you know, there, there's a, uh, there's a brighter future for, for the public, you know, coming down the line. Uh, 
David, thank you so much for being with us here today. I wish you and your family a very happy new year. Thank you. And uh, thank you for being with us here on Liquid Lunch. Thank you, James. Thank you, and happy new year. Stay safe and stay healthy. Bye. Thanks. You too. God bless. Bye-bye. And coming up, we have final comments for 2020 here on Liquid Lunch. My name is James Toto, filling in for John Tobacco. Talk to you soon.